The local church is at the heart of what God is doing in the world. That means that the people of God in a particular location or community are the means by which God makes his mercy, his grace, his love, his compassion, and his very presence known in that community. It's how the people living there would know who God is and what he's like. And when you read through the New Testament, it's churches that launch and plant and establish other churches. This is how God intends for it to be. And this is why we're passionately committed at Chapel Street Church to becoming a family of neighborhood churches. We made the strategic decision not to build one large campus in one location and hope that people drive from farther away, but to reproduce ourselves in communities and in neighborhoods so that the people living there would know the presence of God. And that's why we're so excited to talk about our fourth campus opportunity. God has given us the place in North Aurora and God has preparing a people with Pastor Andrew Griffiths and his team as he's assembling to launch this coming fall. And God has also given us the opportunity to make this happen financially. Recently, a very generous private donor has come and said that they would like to commit to matching 50% of the balance of this project, which is $1.1 million. So if we as a church family can give $550 to $600,000, this person will match that $600,000 and we can launch this campus completely debt free. What a great opportunity God has given us. What better investment could you think of than to invest in the expansion of God's kingdom by expanding the local church, the way that God makes his presence known in a community. I'm asking everyone who calls Chapel Street Church their home, whether or not you attend the North Aurora campus, would you prayerfully consider what contribution you could make above and beyond your regular giving so that we could launch this campus debt-free this fall? And here's how you can do that. Simply indicate in your check, should you write a check, Neighborhood Church Multiplication. Or if you give online digitally, simply select Neighborhood Church Multiplication as your giving destination. And we'll celebrate together what God does in our midst as we launch the next campus for His glory and for the sake of His gospel. Thank you for being part of the Chapel Street Church family. Hey, well, I am so excited about what God is doing in our midst. I'm so grateful uh, for this opportunity we have as a church family to continue seeing uh, the impact grow here in the area. Uh, and I want to say thank you to you as well for your generosity because none of this would be possible without your support. It's so much bigger uh, than myself, Pastor Jeff, or a team of volunteers who are going to North Aurora. Uh, this is the hope that God is placing in all of our lives as, as those who call Chapel Street Church our home. So uh, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support. And we, uh, there's a lot of really exciting things happening right now. I would love to ask you for your prayer uh, and support as well as we continue to build our core team uh, and our group that's going out there for you to pray that we would uh, draw near to one another. We'd love and support one another. But as well that God would uh, create some inroads for us in that neighborhood to get to know our neighbors and love them as well. Hey, well, we are jumping back into our series on First Peter today, and uh, I'm really excited to jump back in. Uh, we're going to be hearing a lot about uh, submitting to authority uh, and what role that plays in our lives as believers. Uh, but whenever we talk about something like that in church, I think uh, it's not our most exciting kind of passage because in our culture, uh, I think we love rebels. I think we love those who play by their own rules, who don't submit to authority, but walk by the beat of their own drum. Uh, and so I was thinking a lot about different rebels this week uh, and some in particular I wanted to share with you. Uh, rebels like Cool Hand Luke. Cool Hand Luke. Now, I will be honest, I didn't even know who Cool Hand Luke was for the longest time, uh, but I was uh, schooled by my good friend Chris Duffy, uh, who uh, is a big fan of Cool Hand Luke because apparently uh, he can eat 50 eggs. Uh, I didn't know what that was about, but he taught me all about that. Uh, we've also got rebels like Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, he's a little bit more contemporary, right? We all love Captain Jack because we don't never know what he's going to do next. He completely lives by his own rules. Exciting guy. But there is one rebel that stands above all else. And I think we all know who that is. It's Han Solo. Uh, 
Han Solo is the greatest rebel of all time. No one tells Han Solo what to do. He's his own guy. He gets the princess. Cool space adventurer, right? Of course, I had to work something like this in in my sermon at some point, so forgive me. Uh, but yeah, we love rebels, don't we? We love stories and characters that kind of walk by their own rules, uh, that set their own pace. Um, and I think in our culture, we admire those who are not beholden to anyone. But what Peter's going to tell us today, what he's going to unpack for us, is this idea that actually it's a much more beautiful thing to submit to authority. Because, as we're going to hear, it's going to proclaim something about God. There's something about the way that we relate to authority that communicates something about God. I think that actually in our culture, one of the most rebellious things, ironically, is to lay down your freedom for the sake of others laying aside your rights for the blessing of others. Uh, it's become quite rebellious because of how we tend to think about our freedom. Now, uh, as I said, we're coming right back in. I want to catch us back up, though, on what we've missed because we've been out for a couple of weeks uh, looking at First Peter. We took some time out to celebrate Easter and Christ's resurrection. Uh, and it's a great point that we're diving back in on here. Uh, but if you remember what this book is about, what this letter is about primarily, is our living home in Christ. And in fact, we've been memorizing 1 Peter 1, 3, which is kind of this summary statement of Peter's letter. It says this, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's this amazing letter that Peter writes to the churches who are in exile, who are scattered around the area, encouraging them to remember what they've been given in Christ. And over the course of the first few weeks of us looking at this letter, we've learned that Peter is calling the church to be holy, to be set apart because of the living hope that they have in Jesus. And because ultimately God is doing something in the lives of believers, he is turning them into living stones, setting them upon the cornerstone of Christ, building them into something greater. And we kind of left off on this idea of, of what the ultimate purpose of God's building project was, and it was this, it was to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He's what 1 Peter 2.9 says, that very uh, statement, in fact. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture, it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So that's where we left off. Peter is telling us that our purpose as Christians, our calling as the church is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us. And now what Peter's gonna do is he's gonna get practical with that. He's gonna tell us what that looks like in our lifestyle. What kind of habits, what kind of uh, choices should we make as believers in order to proclaim Christ? Because proclaiming Christ is not merely a message, it's a lifestyle. Proclaiming Christ is not merely about our words, but it's about how we live. So I want to dive into this, and we're going to see three things that Peter encourages us in in these verses we'll read today. Uh, he's going to encourage us to be subject to the governing authorities, to be gracious, and as well to be encouraged. So let's jump right in and take a look at what it means to be subject. Now before we get into this, I know that uh, here in America, it... Uh, it's always a topic of a little uh, controversy when we talk about government, right? There's all kinds of different feelings about government. We're living in quite a politically divisive time, but if you think it's bad here in the US, you should get to know some British leaders. In fact, I wanted to help you get to know what it's like in Britain for some leaders uh, by telling you a little bit about Margaret Thatcher and Winston Churchill. Margaret Thatcher and Winston Churchill, some of the most famous British leaders in history. Uh, and... Um, let me tell you, they had some uh, terrible things said about them. Uh, in fact, Margaret Thatcher, uh, who was a conservative prime minister, was very disliked by kind of the blue collar workers in the north of England, coal miners, uh, because a lot of their policies kind of cut down and, and damaged their industry. Uh, and so what coal miners did is they set aside a bottle of champagne uh, so that on the day that Margaret Thatcher died, they could pop it and celebrate together. And if that wasn't enough, uh, the week that Margaret Thatcher died, a lot of her uh, haters, a lot of those that disliked her, um, made an effort to get a song into the UK charts. Uh, that song was from The Wizard of Oz, and it was a song called Ding Dong, The Witch Is Dead. Pretty brutal, yeah. We all thought the British people were nice and polite, but we can be mean. 
Uh, and one more story about Winston Churchill. I had to throw this in because it's one of my favorites. Uh, Winston Churchill was so disliked by some, he's definitely held in the high esteem by uh, a lot of people, but some disliked him so much that legend or, or uh, kind of rumor tells us that at one point a woman approached Winston Churchill and said, Sarah, if you were my husband, I would poison you. To which Winston Churchill cleverly replied, if you were my wife, I would drink it. So it definitely has that British wit. But um, we can have a very dysfunctional view of authority, of governing authorities especially. And the Bible, and particularly here in First Peter, uh, we, God wants to encourage us to think rightly about how we're to relate to them. Because the way that we relate to authority is absolutely connected to what we proclaim about Christ. The way we relate to authority is connected to our proclamation of Christ. I want to read uh, these verses with you, picking back up in 1 Peter, in the second half of chapter 2, starting in verse 13, this is what Peter says. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. See, we proclaim Christ, we proclaim the excellencies of him who called us by honoring authority. It's a consistent message throughout all of scripture that we are to be subject to the governing authorities, that we are to respect them and honor them and serve them. Uh, And Paul backs this up when he writes his own letter to to Rome. Uh, He writes to the church in Rome, this in in Romans 13.1. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except that which is from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Now we covered this particular passage in Romans in a little bit more detail uh, in a series we did here at church called The Politics of Jesus in the Fall. Uh, And I really would encourage you to go back and listen to that because this is a really important passage and I know that uh, there's a lot of bad ideas about it. So dig into that if you want to. But for today's purpose, it's enough to say that the Bible's message is that governing authorities, the government, is given to us for our good. That it's a good thing instituted by good to restrain evil, and to help the flourishing of society, to support and encourage order in society. But what Peter's saying in his letter is a little bit different, and we might have the effect lost on us if we don't understand what it was actually like for Peter and those that he's writing to to live under their government, to live under the governing authorities of their day, Rome. Um, They were uh, headed by Emperor Nero at the time of this letter's writing, And Emperor Nero is known for a lot of things, none of them good. Uh, Nero was known for uh, not at all being a fan of Christians. And in fact, Nero, uh, it said, would take Christians, uh, put them on pikes in the Colosseum, uh, and set them on fire to light his chariot rides at night. Because he wanted to have light to see, and so he he would literally burn Christians alive. Uh, And if that wasn't enough, we're also uh, led to believe by some historians that Emperor Nero started the fire of Rome and blamed it on the Christians. He was not a fan of Christians at all. And in fact, the Roman government in general were very skeptical, very suspicious of the early church because as believers in one God, they were worried that they were kind of revolutionaries. And in fact, Jesus himself was crucified in part because it was suggested that he might be a revolutionary. And so they were very suspicious. And this was the government that they lived under a government that was not just, a government that was not good, and certainly not providing blessings to the church, to the Christians. But Peter says, this government, those authorities that are doing that to you, I want you to be subject to them. How can Peter say to these early Christians whose friends and family were being persecuted systematically by Nero, how could he say be subject to that government? Because of what he says in verse 13. Let's read that together. Verse 13 says, be subject, and this is the important part, for the Lord's sake. See, we don't honor authority. We don't put ourselves in subjection to authority for our sake. We don't even do it for the government's sake. We do it for the Lord's. As believers, we believe that we have been called to be in subject to the government because it makes a proclamation about what we believe about God. It is a statement about what we believe about God. It communicates to an unbelieving world, to those around us, what we think about the God we love. It communicates that we trust him, 
that our confidence is not who's in the White House or who's in power, it's who's on the throne. Is that what we communicate as believers? Now I know that that doesn't sit well with us. I know that when we talk about this kind of idea of of honoring authority and being subject to authority, it doesn't sit well with us because a lot of us have a lot of fear and concern and distrust of our authorities. But imagine how hard it was for these believers. Imagine how hard it was for these Christians who saw what Nero did to hear Peter say these words to them, be subject to the governing authorities. If Peter can be subject to Nero, if the early church can be subject to Nero, we can be subject to our governing authorities because we live in a much better world. But on those occasions where things go wrong, Peter has an encouragement as well. Because even under unjust governments, like the one that Peter lived under, there's an encouragement. Verse 15, he says, For this is the will of God, God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. By doing good, put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now I know that here today, I'm sure those watching, there is all kinds of feelings about the governing authorities in your life. I certainly have a lot of thoughts about it the ones in my life. But, they are worthy of our honor. They're worthy of our honor. Not because of what they've done, not because of the quality of their leadership, but because of what Christ has done and what he's called us to do. If you are disappointed, concerned, or angry, if you are fearful over the governing authorities today, then I want you to hear Peter's words. God's will for you is to do good, to put to shame the ignorance of foolish men. If you distrust them, the best thing that you can do is serve God. It's to pray for your leaders, not slander them, not mock them. It's to serve and love your neighbors, not argue with them about why their specific political persuasions are foolish or wrong. See, as Christians, as believers, as the church, we need to let our proclamation, we need to let our witness, the witness of our actions and our words, be more about our trust and our confidence in God and his goodness than they are our distrust and fear over earthly authorities. What do most of your social media posts or your comments to your friends about our governing authority say about your belief in God? Does it proclaim your trust in him or does it proclaim your distrust in the government? Does it proclaim your love of Christ and his goodness or does it proclaim your dislike of leaders? Now, Peter's going to widen the scope for us. It doesn't end here just with government. He's talking about all kinds of submission to authority. And so he's going to widen the scope here in verse 16. And this is what he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us to be gracious. To be gracious. Before we dive into this, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the unwritten rules of flying on an airplane. Um, not a lot of us have got to go flying in this past year with everything that's gone on. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a refresher of what traveling on uh, plane life is like. But here are my questions for you today. Answer them where you are at home. Uh, these are what is appropriate on an airplane. Number one, is it okay to clap when the plane lands? Is it okay to clap when the plane lands? I think that's a little odd. Uh, I have been on a couple of planes where this has happened, and honestly, I, I did not know what was happening when it occurred. So I'm going to say, I don't think it is. Planes land all the time. Is it really that amazing? I don't know. Some people think it is. Some people think it is. Um, number two, is it okay to recline your seat during meal times? I will have to admit again, I don't think that this one is. I get so grumpy when I'm, I'm trying to eat and the seat's coming back towards me. Not least of all because I'm way too tall to fit in the regular seats. So it's difficult as it is. So if you're in front of me, I'm sorry, but please don't recline your seat when we're trying to eat. And then lastly, and this is the most important one, guys. The most important one. Is it okay to take off your socks and shoes on an airplane? Just take a look at this for me for a second. Take a look at this picture. Does this look okay? Does this look okay? I think not. I'm sure that that person is very comfortable, but they need to learn an important lesson that we all do, and this lesson is this, is that our freedom isn't always for our benefit, 
right? I know that you can't take those socks and shoes off, but maybe it's not good for everybody else. Um, you know, we all form rules on what we can and we can't do based on our preferences, most often. The idea of what we can do on a plane or out in public, a lot of the rules that govern us are our preferences. But freedom, as the Bible tells us and, and, and defines, is not for what we want. Freedom is not for us having the ability to do whatever we want. Freedom, biblical freedom, is very different. This is what Peter goes on to tell us, starting in verse 16. He says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. We proclaim Christ by using our freedom for the sake of others. That's the next way that we proclaim Christ in our lifestyle. We proclaim Christ by using our freedom for the sake of others. See, as I mentioned, biblical freedom isn't the ability to do whatever we want. Biblical freedom is the ability to do what's right in the eyes of God, to do what's right for the sake of our neighbor. The longest time scripture tells us that because of sin, we're in bondage to ourselves. We are enslaved to our own impulses and our desires. We live for ourselves. But Christ, by loving us, by redeeming us, has, has ransomed us from that slavery. And now our freedom has been given to us, not for ourselves because he's loved us, it's been given to us for our neighbors. Biblical freedom is the ability to be a servant of God. This is what Paul, uh, uh, Peter says. He says, use your freedom to be a servant of God. Well, what's a servant of God? It's what we read in verse 17. Verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That's the qualities of a servant of God. And I want to flesh these out just a little bit here today. Peter starts by saying, he edges us to honor everyone. Use our freedom to be a servant of God, to honor everyone. Even the very emperor who's persecuting them. And Peter even goes on to give us an example of this in this passage. He talks about a servant and a master and how that servant relates to his master if they're in Christ. Now, uh, I want to give some context to this because whenever we read in Scripture uh, about servants and about slaves, there's, there's a lot of ideas that can fill our minds. Uh, and in this instance, we're talking about servants, which is very different to what we normally think of when we think of uh, slavery, an example, in, in the South. Uh, this was not in Rome. Uh, slavery was not based and servitude was not based on uh, ethnicity. Um, it was... Um, very different, uh, and f for example, there's, there's some servants in Rome um, were very educated. They had a lot of rights, a lot more rights than we would expect, um, and in, in fact, some servants in some wealthy households had more power than uh, free persons. Now, in saying that, my point is not to say that this is an okay thing. In fact, Peter acknowledges in this passage it's unjust, it's an unjust system. It devalues the dignity of those persons and it, it strips them of many of the freedoms that they should have as people. But it doesn't strip them of their freedom in Christ. The society in which Peter lived, this, this broken system, did not strip them of their freedom in Christ. And the point that Peter is making when he talks about this is he's saying that because of Christ, even that servant has the freedom to do what's right in the eyes of God and to love their neighbor. And their masters can't take that from them. The purpose of freedom for that servant wasn't to liberate themselves, it wasn't to fight back against their authorities, but it was through humility and through surrender to do good, to love and honor their masters so that Christ would be seen, even in their suffering, even in the injustice of what they were in. What does that look like for us? What does it look like to use our freedom to honor everyone, even those who may be unjust or cause us suffering? Because that's what this is really about. Not just honoring those that we like, who are worthy, but those who we struggle to honor. I can't help but be drawn to Pastor John Kelly's words from uh, a few weeks ago when Pastor John Kelly came and visited us and talked about uh, the love that we should have for our neighbors. And he talked about inviting people to your dinner table, inviting those who are different than you to your dinner table, loving them, inviting people even that cause you pain, people in your family, people who've made wrong decisions, the, the alcoholic brother-in-law, the, um, the addicted cousin, all kinds of people that, 
you struggle to honor and respect and love and serve, those are the people that you are actually in fact called as a believer in Christ to honor. In Philippians, Paul tells us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in everything, through loneliness of mind, esteem others. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That's what Christian lifestyle looks like. So let me ask you today, whose interests do you least want to look to? Who is it most difficult to value above yourself? Who is it that you least want to encourage to pray for and to serve? Perhaps the message this morning is that you're called to honor them. To use your freedom that you have been given to surrender your own concerns and look to the concerns of others. Now Peter also urges the church to love the brotherhood. Uh, I wanna go through this quickly as well because this is really important, especially for us. Our freedom should be used for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for their benefit and their blessing. And that's what he gets into. He says, love the brotherhood. Now back then, it's worth stating that there were all kinds of tensions that existed in the early church. There were ethnic tensions, there was political divisions just as there are today, whether we should support Rome, whether we should fight against Rome. And in fact, in Jesus' closest circle, there were people who believed those two different things. But in Christ, we're told by Paul and by Peter that those divisions, those walls of hostility have been broken down, that we are to love one another. Jesus, in fact, himself said at the Last Supper, that the way that we love one another is a way that the world will see who he is. It's a proclamation, a proclamation of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So what are the divisions amongst the brotherhood today? What are the divisions that we face in the church? Well, they're not all that different. There are certainly political divisions in our churches today. Divisions over whether we can fellowship with people who believe things that are different politically than us. Which side is more like Christ? Spoiler alert, neither of them. We honor one another, we love one another apart from the divisions and the reasons why we can split from one another because that's who Christ has called us to be. It is a poor proclamation to the world. A poor proclamation to the world when the kind of love that we have for one another is built on who is like us, on who appears most worthy. The kind of love that we found in Christ should call us to to not hold our brothers and sisters at arm's length, but to embrace them, to love them. Not only those that we think are worthy or who fit our sensibilities or our preferences, but all those who call Christ Jesus their savior. Lastly, I want to mention really quickly here as well, Peter says, fear God. He says, fear God. Freedom should be tempered by a healthy fear of God, is Peter's point. Freedom should be tempered by respect for God's word and his commands and his call on our life. We don't use our freedom to get whatever we want. We do what God's called us to do because we've been bought with a price. See, what we're really saying here is that though grace covers a multitude of sins, so there's forgiveness that overflows, we should pursue those things that God's called us to pursue. We shouldn't use God's grace and his mercy as an excuse to live how we please and use our freedom for ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but all of these ideas, all these things that Peter has called us to are so challenging. I have a really hard time, and even in studying this this last week, thinking about how this plays out in my life, I'm convicted that I fall very short of what Peter's calling me to in this passage. And that's because sometimes we neglect the last encouragement here, the encouragement that Peter has for us. To be encouraged, this is what he tells us. Start in verse 21. To this you have been called, because... Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We proclaim Christ by being transformed by his example. We proclaim the one who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light by being transformed by the example of Christ. The highest authority who laid down his freedom for our sake, the one most worthy of resisting and rebelling against the unjust and and corrupt government of his time, yet served in humility and laid his life down. Jesus showed Peter what it looked like to proclaim his father. And now Peter is showing us what it's like to proclaim Christ. By pointing us to the one who is the perfect example of everything that Peter is asking of us. If we go to what Paul says in Philippians 2, it's very similar to this again. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 say this. Some of the most beautiful verses in all of scripture. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is because Christ laid down his freedom for us that we do not need to demand our own freedom. It's because of his example that we now have the power to live this out ourselves. Final verse in uh, 1 Peter 2 says this, for you were straying like sheep, but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The shepherd and the overseer. The one who cares for you. He's using that language of shepherd and overseer because Peter wants the church to know the one who cares for you, the one who holds you in his hands is Christ. He is the one that meets your every need as a shepherd meets the needs of his sheep, as he guards his flock, as he protects them, and as he watches over them. That's who Christ is, our good shepherd. And we've been returned to him by the love of Christ. Trusting him and believing his words, believing that Jesus really is all that we need, that we don't need to fight for the right candidate, that we don't need to overcome those who believe differently than us, that we don't need to by force pursue the kingdom of God here in this world, but by grace, all of that belief, all of those actions proclaim the joy of the gospel. It proclaims who Christ is. It proclaims that he is the ultimate authority, that he is the one in who we are truly in submission to, who we lay our freedom aside for because he did it for us. But it's also the way that God intends to transform the world. It's the way he transforms our hearts. It's the way that he transforms the church. And it's the way that he ultimately is going to transform our entire world. Not by force, not by resistance, but by grace, by serving our neighbors. If you look at something like the Grand Canyon, an amazing landscape, one of the most amazing landscapes on earth, in fact, you you might expect that something like that was created and carved by an earthquake or, or some kind of landslide, something like that, an explosion. But the truth is, the Grand Canyon, as beautiful it is, was carved by something very gentle, and that was water. See, the steady, consistent, faithful flow of water can do amazing things in the landscape. Can transform landscapes. And in that same way, the love of Christ and our service as his people can transform the world around us. We're so 
tied to this idea that in order to make changes, we have to, to fight and press. And, and in fact, a lot of people in Jesus' day and Peter's day felt the exact same thing. They, they, they longed for Jesus to overthrow Rome. I'm sure that these believers, as they suffered under Nero, longed for someone to do something, for God to end this persecution. But instead, God says, become servants. Lay aside your freedom to serve others. Suffer even unjustly at times so that people will see who I am. So that by doing good, you will put to shame the ignorance of foolish men. And how can we do that? By looking to the shepherd and overseer of our souls who's called us back to him. There is nothing that Christ will ask of you that he first didn't do himself for you. There is no pattern of living that you are called to that Christ didn't first live for you and gave himself to for you. So, Chapel Street Church, live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this hard message, this challenging message. Lord, we we hear these words and we wonder how we could possibly live up to the calling that you've placed on our lives. And I pray this morning you would draw us back to the example of Christ, the one who's loved us, the one who lived all of this out for us, who submitted himself to authority. Even though he was in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself a servant. May we as your people now, in order to proclaim the goodness of the one who's called us, may we lay aside our freedom, may we surrender our lives for the sake of your gospel, for the sake of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.